Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Almost good evening. We might still have a, a few late arrivals, but I'm getting some signals at the back. Can you hear me okay at the back of the room? Speak up. Is that better? Maybe if I stand in the centre here. Um, good afternoon. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Australian Academy of the Humanities annual lecture. My name is Inga Davis and I'm the Executive Director of the Academy of the Humanities. I would like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people, the owners of the country we're meeting on today. I extend my respects to Elders past and present and emerging and acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people's experiences, knowledges and practices are intrinsic to Australia's national story and our shared future prosperity. The Academy of the Humanities is the national body for the humanities in Australia, championing the contribution that humanities, arts and culture make to our national life. We are one of five learned academies and through our advisory and public engagement work, we demonstrate the importance of bringing ethical, historical, creative and cultural knowledge and experience to bear on issues that matter to our communities, our society, now and into the future. The Academy's annual lecture is one of the ways we share the breadth and depth of scholarship in the humanities and the impact and imaginative power of this work. During their term, the Academy president is invited to deliver the lecture on their research. Tonight, we have the pleasure from hearing from our Academy president, Emeritus Professor Leslie Hedge, an esteemed geographer specialising in human environmental and conceptual and material. Leslie was elected to the fellowship in 2004 and took up the role of president in November 2020. Her three year term comes to an end this November. Leslie, <laughs> I heard some. <laughs> Leslie is the Redmond Barry Distinguished Professor Emeritus at the University of Melbourne. She has contributed to international debates about relationships between society and nature, and her most recent research has been on the cultural dimensions of environmental issues, including climate change. Leslie held an ARC Laureate Fellowship at the University of Wollongong from 2009 to 2014, where she was Director of the Australian Centre for Cultural Environmental Research. She was King Carl XVI Visiting Professor in Environmental Science in Sweden from 2004 to 2006, and was awarded the prestigious Vega Medal of the Swedish Society for Anthropology and Geography in 2015. It is now my great pleasure to welcome Leslie to the stage to deliver her lecture, How Should We Conceptualise the Human in the Anthropocene World? Please welcome Leslie. Thanks very much, Inga, and thanks everyone for being here. This is the drain outside the geography building in Bouverie Street, just to the south of us, just south of Grattan Street. It's built uh, on top of the creek that ran through Melbourne Uni, just west of this building, then via Bouverie Street into Elizabeth Street before draining into the Yarra under the present Flinders Street station. Eels, a long time food source and very important food source for the Wurundjeri, still migrate up and down the drains under Bouverie Street. So acknowledging that I work and that we meet this week on the unceded Wurundjeri country, I also acknowledge that the Anthropocene concept has some deep colonial heritage, as I'll explain. In July this year, the Anthropocene Working Group of the International Commission on Stratigraphy announced that Canada's Crawford Lake 
would be nominated as the golden spike marking the beginning of the Anthropocene. The geological epoch in which humanity has profoundly affected Earth and human activities have come to dominate many Earth surface processes. Sediments at the base of the waters in the limestone sinkhole preserve an undisturbed record of surrounding environmental conditions, including embedded contaminants such as fly ash from the burning of fossil fuels and traces of radioactive plutonium from atmospheric nuclear bomb testing. The base of the Anthropocene, it was suggested, would be dated at 1950 CE. The media discussion around this announcement was the latest expression of debates that have swirled for two decades now since the Anthropocene concept was mooted. Was this the right date? Do we need a new geological epoch? Is a single type site like Crawford Lake appropriate to encompass the full range and diversity of human impacts? Most particularly, the discussion was and is characterised by a persistent human we. We have instigated a sixth mass extinction of other species. We have changed the biosphere and altered the chemistry of the oceans by burning fossil fuels. We have uprooted forests and poisoned land with chemicals. We have set off a series of events and processes that now threaten to exceed our control. As political ecologist Kai Heron commented on what was then Twitter, it turns out that the false universalism of the human we've spent decades dismantling is in rude health. So the Anthropocene concept contains many co tensions and contradictions that it's my task to unravel this evening, some to dismantle, some to bring into clearer view and live with. The universal human whose influences are undifferentiated geographically, socioeconomically, demographically, the essentialized human that goes with notions of human nature, whether characterized by ingenuity or stupidity, teleology and its connotations of progress and inevitability, the notion of impact as separated and separable, the meteor concept of impact. All these are connected to the key tension between what I'll call and what others have called big N nature and big S society. And finally, the tension between human power and influence on Earth system processes on one hand against the likelihood of tipping into a new set of boundary conditions beyond our control. This last dot point is not one that I think we can dismantle. It's a tension we need to bring into view and live with. Now, this diagram tries to capture these tipping points within a deepish time perspective with the Holocene, the last 10,000 or so years at the back of the diagram and the future in the foreground, colder conditions to the left and hotter to the right. As we approach planetary thresholds in a number of variables, we're currently understood to have a rapidly closing window, some would argue too late, to stabilise the conditions that would allow the flourishing and or survival of human societies in a form that we would recognise. Note that there are various combinations in these debates of quite arcane geology and stratigraphy and a broader kind of cultural discourse that we can think of as hashtag Anthropocene. The dismantling of problematic concepts and the distillation of new ones does not follow a linear intellectual or cultural trajectory. It's something of a dance. The contradictions and dilemmas I'm discussing are very deeply embedded in Western scholarship and in our understanding of the humanities themselves. So in critiquing the Anthropocene concept, I do so not because the issues it raises are not important. On the contrary, it's because they're so fundamental to the survival and flourishing of life on Earth. So my aim tonight is threefold and these aims intertwine. One thread traces elements of both the rupture and the survival of the essentialized human in a few different parts of the humanities and social sciences. To do so, I draw on a heritage of critique and scholarship. But I note also that some of our most fundamental refigurings have come when humanities and science evidence converges. 
The mind-body dichotomy was under, undone by both chemistry and feminism. The human as the exceptionalist pinnacle of evolution was undone by geology, evolutionary bi biology and archaeology, which works in both scientific and humanities registers. A second thread exhorts us to keep excavating the human and the humanities in order to reimagine ourselves in relation to the world. In my argument, this gives more hope, more traction on fundamental causes and more political leverage. And the onus continues to be on the humanities to lead this task. And Australia is a place from which to make some quite distinctive contributions. And so the third thread is how we might mobilise a much more rigorous and critically informed anthropos into the future. So there are challenges for all of us, and here the we is the we of the humanities, to examine how that dance plays out in our work. In asking why some tropes are so persistent, we must turn our attention to the humanities themselves. Consider the extent to which we're complicit as well as dismantling problematic conceptualizations, we have also mobilized them. I include myself in this critique. As Academy President, I've at times found myself mobilizing what we can think of as a strategic essentialism in the defense of the humanities. I've done it somewhat uneasily, but I've, I've done it. Yet, as we know, critique of the human nature binary has been a feature of scholarship in the humanities and social sciences for more than 40 years now. There have been widespread attempts to unsettle and dismantle that binary, as well as necessary work in analysing its extraordinary resilience and embeddedness in our thinking and institutions. There are many eminent scholars who say it's unrealistic to expect that we can get away from dualistic views of the world or that we might want to. I think it's always both, but that we can do better to understand and communicate the ways in which humans and what we call nature are always mutually embedded. So the human that I want to bring life to this evening is a figure of multiplicities and contingencies. My perspective is post-humanist in the sense defined by Juanita Sundberg, that it firstly refuses to treat the human as an ontological given the privileged, if not the only actor of consequence. We must understand questions of difference and distinction as empirically open questions, ripe for our most thorough scholarly efforts, rather than assume them in advance. And second, it refuses to treat the human as disembodied and autonomous, separate from the world of nature and animality. Our companion species have included other species of homo and the microbiota in our guts that help constitute our bodily selves. Our very beings contain the signatures of the earth itself, from the strontium in our bones to the pesticides in our breast milk. In 2020, a virus a tenth of a micron in diameter restructured social lives around the world. Even the boundary of life is not as clear as it once was. So the previously neat categories of technology or materials are giving way to more lively configurations of matter. Artificial intelligence and intelligent plants challenge long-standing ideas of will, autonomy and agency, as we're going to learn much more of in the next two days. So who is this we, the Anthropos? If the we is the human species, the undifferentiated human subject, its experiences of the social and environmental changes under discussion already vary widely to the extent that a shared human experience may be a rather small lens. And as catastrophe comes closer to home, the Black Summer bushfires affected the lives of more than half the population of Australia. Who is this we who consider ourselves modern, but who now grieve for the approaching demise of modernity? The modern subject in this discussion is all of us who live with the idea of progress, however that's imagined. It's imagined differently in both left and right political orientations. They have worked towards different utopias, but both share the aspirations of modernity. The modern subject values autonomy and individual freedom, and connects the future with the possibility of improvement. 
If we moderns have had the hope of progress and improvement, the reality has been dramatically unequal. As the histories of capitalism and colonialism have shown us, the hopes of many have been built on other people's suffering. In no country have we managed to build societies with both low per capita ecological footprints and the highest levels of human well-being. So we must acknowledge the Western centrism of our catastrophic scenarios. For many people in many parts of the world, daily life is already and has long been infused with catastrophe and grief. And I have to just acknowledge the suffering in Gaza this month. The strongest critique of the Anthropocene has been from those who argue that the species concept is a category mistake. Species level impacts are impossible to reconcile with the huge historical and contemporary differentials in access to resources. Indeed, as Andreas Malm and Alf Hornberg have argued, uneven distribution is a condition for the very existence of modern fossil fuel technology. Thus, we've had differentiations that draw attention to more particular social and political drivers, the capitalist scene, the economist scene, the plantation scene, to name a few. Jason Moore, historian and geographer, helps us understand how big N nature and big S society have become separate and purified domains as a product of the history of capitalism. This is always a tricky argument at, as we need to acknowledge the um, contradiction here. The clear division between big N nature and big S society is a, an historically and intellectually false one. Yet in behaving as if it is true, we make it so in institutions, in academic disciplines, and in everyday discussions. Moore's key contribution has been to show how capitalism, colonialism, and modernity are all part of this same process. The view of nature as external is a fundamental condition, he argues, of capital accumulation. That accumulation depended and continues to depend on what he calls the four cheaps, labour power, food, energy, and raw materials. Colonies provided new frontiers of cheap labour and raw materials, relegating that labour, slaves and Indigenous peoples, to the domain of nature made the violence of modernity more palatable. In a somewhat hopeful vein, Moore's view is that capitalism is in its death throes because it's running out of these cheats. Now, without getting too far into the contested areas of when the Anthropocene started, and that's a whole other debate, I find this colonial date, let's say 1492 or the long 16th century, most convincing. It has support in the sciences as well, particularly through the work of Simon Lewis and Mark Maslin. Importantly, it's convincing because of what it tells us about the very specific underlying drivers of colonial capital. Indigenous scholars have built their own critique of the totalizing dimensions of the Anthropocene. Heather Davis and Red River Métis scholar Zoe Todd have argued the species level approach of the Anthropocene inadvertently and unintentionally signals our argument that the Anthropocene as the extension and enactment of colonial logic systematically erases difference. Potawatomi philosopher Carl Powers White goes further and talks about an enfolding of time, arguing that Indigenous peoples are living in our ancestors' dystopia. In the Anthropocene then, some Indigenous peoples already inhabit what our ancestors would have likely characterised as a dystopian future. For White, the disruption of the present is just part of the disruption of the settler. If there is something different about the current dystopia than what his ancestors experienced with colonialism, it would be the additional disruptor of climate change. And Munanjali and South Sea Islander scholar Chelsea Watego is more succinct, rejecting the mirage of progress towards the future in her injunction to mob to fuck hope, be sovereign. Consider the scene as well as the anthropos. The long evolutionary path, mobilizing stone tools and manipulating fire is a common trope in the standard geological Anthropocene narrative. 
I think this is more by default than design, as scientists have sought a communications hook for a complex narrative. But the default, of course, reverts to deeply embedded assumptions. The default is no accident. The linear view of history and prehistory structures the dominant modes of visual representation, timelines and stratigraphic diagrams. The result is a teleological view of human history in which the negative outcome seems inevitable, a visual trajectory further reinforced by the many exponential curves that characterise the singular Anthropocene. I'm sure you've all seen versions of this diagram that show exponential increase in a number of different indicators over the last few centuries. The shape of this view of history is similar to the, these curves, which again, I'm sure you're all familiar with versions of these in a view of um, evolution. So what I want to draw attention to now, however, is the multiple and differentiated or how the multiple and differentiated figurations of the human are pervading archeological time. The unitary model of human evolution in which Homo sapiens is the last so far of many ancestors standing is a well-established cultural trope. But it's quite wrong against the evidence provided by new archeological and DNA discoveries. These include, for example, the findings that Neanderthals contributed between one and 4% of contemporary European and Asian nuclear DNA, and that a genetically different population, dubbed the Denisovans, was living in Siberia at times contemporaneous with, with both. Now, my focus here is not what this means for the specifics of the human migration story, fascinating as that is. Given the rapid pace of research, uh, the specifics of any part of this story uh, are likely to change considerably in the next few decades. So, for example, we had uh, a decade or so ago the, the mooted coexistence of Homo sapiens and Homo floresiensis in, in Flores, uh, much discussed, but evidence which no longer holds. But rather, it's on the way the unitary and progressivist model of human evolution is being broken down. Catherine Yusuf goes so far as to argue that these recent discoveries have conceptualized, reconceptualized humanity as interspecies. We increasingly have a picture of hominin evolution as temporally, sexually, and geographically differentiated in their migration and forms of territorialization. Among many works of history, anthropology and history and philosophy of science that critique universalist, essentialist and Western claims about humanity's past, I point to the 2020 volume edited by Australian archaeologists Martin Poor and Jacqueline Matthews. They note the tension between human unity and universality on the one hand and local cultural variability and difference on the other. Drawing on Mesia Landau's and Viktor Stokowski's older work on narratives, they argue that the building blocks of the modern Western ontology, including environmental determinism and individualism, among others, have structured recent views of so-called human, so-called modern human origins in a problematic and universalizing fashion. An important element in Landau's analysis was the hero narrative which presents human evolution as a mastery of successive challenges leading towards an ultimate goal. Invariably, the latter is Western civilization. Now, care is needed here, of course, of universalist claims about disciplines. Poor and Matthews are critiquing the failure of their own discipline, archeology, span to come to terms with some of its own significant theoretical and empirical developments. <laughs> We can see something of the same trends in the debate over the origins of modern human behaviour. On the basis of their detailed review of the archaeological evidence published this year, Eleanor Scarry and Manuel Will argue that decades of scientific research have continuously failed to find a discrete threshold for a complete modernity package, and the concept is theoretically obsolete. The emerging pattern of behavioural complexity 
from the Middle Stone Age conforms to an intricate mosaic characterised by spatially discrete, temporally variable and historically contingent trajectories. So Poor and Matthews argue that these evolutionary perspectives almost necessarily create a progressive understanding of human history that's characterised by a movement out of or emancipation from nature. Here they connect to Kay Anderson's important and detailed work on historicising the human and humanism. She argues we need to historicise the construction and maintenance of humanism much more than we do, rather than glossing 400 or so years of no change since the Enlightenment. The we that Anderson is talking about and that I again invoke here is the collective we of the humanities. In her 2018 paper in Environmental Humanities, Anderson, writing then with Colin Perrin, argues that we've too easily equated human exceptionalism with a theological perspective and thus thinking that we've moved beyond it. They show, in contrast, how human exceptionalism has persisted beyond Christian and Cartesian notions of the mind-body dualism through and into the historicity of a human defined by physicality, walking upright, large-brained, two-handed, as drawn from archaeological and evolutionary evidence. These categories and concepts are not separate from colonial history, but inextricably entwined with them. As Catherine Youssef notes in her 2021 paper on the inhumanities, both Anthropocene studies and the environmental humanities have a tendency to disregard the historical colonial geographies that materially delivered humanism and its structures of thought. These structures of thought, including the human and its others, and in parallel, the discourse of nature and its others. So Anderson and Perrin's injunction to keep historicising our categories also applies to the idea of the Anthropocene and its precursors. Anthropocene pioneers, Paul Crutzen and Eugene Sturmer, have acknowledged their debt to the mid-20th century Venegren Symposia, resulting in the massive edited classics you see here, Man's Role in Changing the Face of the Earth and the Earth as Transformed by Human Action, as well as the earlier ideas of George Perkins Marsh, Teilhard de Chardin and others. Michael Simpson has identified three Eurocentric themes in these works that also flow into key Anthropocene texts. Mm -hmm. The narrative about the gradual progression of human cultures through different stages of advancement and development. The contention that at some stage along this trajectory of human development, human cultures step out of a state of nature or savagery and into a state of civilization. These states of savagery and civilization are distinguished by society's relationship to the non-human world. And thirdly, that this entire process of the development of human culture through the various identified historical stages is presented as having a teleological trajectory. Now, Simpson argues that all three tropes are seen in key Anthropocene texts, such as Stefan Crutzen and McNeil's 2007 article, The Anthropocene, Are Humans Now Overwhelming the Great Forces of Nature? So it's relevant to also note that the Venegren Symposia were themselves part of the post-war emergence of globalised science, for example, through the International Geophysical Year of 1957-58. Libby Robin and her colleagues have traced the role of science, particularly globalised science, in speaking for the environment. So I've shown how the Anthropocene has much more in common with colonial constructions of humanity than is often acknowledged. It's less a radical reconfiguration than a reinscription of long-standing views about human separateness from and transcendence out of nature. While we consider the important role for the humanities in leading these conversations and helping think otherwise, it's worth reminding ourselves of the distinctiveness of Australian contributions in these discussions. 
Some of, the, <coughs> some of these are old stories, some are new. By the way, this slide was thrown up automatically in the PowerPoint designer when I typed the heading. <laughs> so I decided to go with it because it shows something about the dominant tropes. The Australian colonial encounter collided with and helped reconfigure the emerging understanding of the human. As Anderson shows, the humanist evidence of the human in Western European thought was thrown into crisis in the early to mid 1800s in confrontation with radically divergent modes of life in far flung places. Specifically, the encounter with Indigenous Australians exposed the fragility of a power base that staked its logic in the idea of human separateness from nature. Australian archaeologists have long grappled with the fact that Northern Hemisphere periodization, such as Neolithic and Paleolithic, do not work in the Australian context. Australian archaeology in the last decades of the 20th century characterised its contribution as unsettling the myth of an unchanging people in an unchanging land. The long history of cultural fire evident in the environmental record of Australia challenged Northern Hemisphere frameworks of vegetation succession, the ecological equivalent of the progressivist views of human evolution. Much of that fire now goes by the name cultural burning and a variety of sources continue to contribute to our understanding of it, from the historical and anthropological records of Indigenous lifeways to contemporary Indigenous knowledge and governance. We've identified that environmental appreciation as well as destruction is deeply embedded in settler Australian culture from early colonial aesthetics to contemporary backyard gardens. As historian Andrea Gaynor implied in her review of Tim Bonahady's Colonial Earth, we can't comfort ourselves with the conceit that we are more environmentally aligned than our colonial forebears. Love is not enough. The upshot is that environmental appreciation is not enough. Beyond experiencing and declaring our love of particular places and species, we also need to understand the deep and enduring nature of the threats we pose to them and to organise alternatives to our destructive economy and culture. We've built a rich recess research base about the environmental engagements and contributions of non-Anglo migrants to Australia, many of whom come from contexts where the idea of a clear separation between humans and nature is an intellectual and practical absurdity. And most importantly, Indigenous people have fought themselves into the wider intellectual space where we now have vibrant voices, including by influential collaborations. For example, the Bawaka Collective, who describe themselves, their we, as an Indigenous and non-Indigenous human and more than human research collective. In a series of publications, Bawaka Country is provocatively positioned as a lead author, as an ethical imperative. Centred within Indigenous ep epistemologies and ontologies, this research talks about and practices relations of co-becoming. These authors don't write about the Anthropocene as such, but their words are highly relevant. They write about the relational field as denying humans the fabrication that they may stand aside, act on each other, or a discrete non-human environment. It places us all squarely within an ethics of co-becoming and demands that we attend to the connections that bind and co-constitute us. Without suggesting that the authors on this slide would necessarily agree with one another, I think it is possible to see the influence of so much of Australia's history and country in the tenor of these works. So that's just a few examples. So what do we do with all this? The propositions I have advanced are most consistent with the available evidence, but do they give us anywhere to go? So I want to summarise this using two verbs, refuse and regenerate. What if we refuse to reproduce the divide that is so complicit in our problems? Big N nature, big S society. 
What if the site of our intellectual activism is changing ideas, changing how we name and discuss the relations that give and receive life? It can often feel as though we don't have time to do this, to keep working on the big conceptual issues. I'm often asking myself, is this the most effective thing I could be doing? But the depth of the cultural change required means that this particular work has never been more important. What is the best way to refuse? To point it out when we see it, to show the history embedded in many of our institutions, policies, frameworks, cultures and scientific endeavours, including environmental ones. Better understanding of the causal mechanisms and drivers of what we call the Anthropocene helps us to act more effectively. If the problem is the species level Anthropos, what can we do except get rid of ourselves or the ones we designate as other? If the driver is not population per se, but the destructive system of colonial capitalism, we designate a different enemy. How to regenerate? Because our understandings of the world are materially constituted in situated ways, they can also be reconstituted differently. What stands for human has changed over time. Relations can solidify into particular forms and processes and endure over evolutionary and shorter timescales. They can also be disrupted, fall apart and be reconfigured. We are not a single species in terms of climate and environmental impacts and responsibility. That is a category mistake. We can create a more open and contingent human for the Anthropocene, one or many who can act restoratively and collectively and collaboratively rather than destructively. We can find space for a regenerative and restorative human presence, not just a destructive one. Our work can make visible many already existing regenerative alternatives, existing in a rich variety of cultural contexts. Some of this research into the everyday in ways that complicate it. Some of it is in partnerships with different communities with whom we research and act and have impact. Relational concepts of agency help us to articulate diverse locations of generative political action that can create traction in the same direction. This might complicate the field of view, but it also helps us imagine more diverse points of intervention. There's lots of different types of work to be done. So it's in simultaneously refusing and regenerating that we, both the we of the humanities and the we of the wider world that we serve, can bring our best possible collective futures into being. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Leslie, for an absolutely outstanding annual Academy lecture. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge Leslie's contribution to the Academy of the Humanities. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, her term as president is coming to an end next week um, at the, the AGM. Leslie's been the Academy President uh, since November 2020. She's provided exceptional leadership throughout this time. She has steered the Academy through the global pandemic, through a raft of changes coming with a new federal government and a raft of policy submissions. And most notably, it's been under Leslie's leadership that council has worked to establish the new Indigenous Studies section, which will come into being next week. It's a significant milestone for all of us, and it's one that we're incredibly proud of, and we are thankful to you for your leadership and guidance in getting this over the line. So please do join me in once again acknowledging Leslie's contribution to the Academy as president. There will be further accolades at dinner tomorrow night, <laughs> much to Leslie's dismay, and also another round of applause for this evening's lecture. Thank you, Leslie.
Folks, when you arrived, you might have noticed that we have a lovely cocktail bar set up in the courtyard. We hope that you're all able to join us for a drink. We haven't um, got the opportunity for formal uh, questions and answers uh, as part of the lecture program now, but please have a chat with Leslie and, and colleagues uh, and enjoy your evening. Look forward to seeing you at tomorrow's symposium. Thank you. Thank you.